Why is recorded in front of a live studio audience. So what are your plans for Thanksgiving? Nothing. Okay, great. I'm going to be adding over <laughs> this um, sounds of a horse-driven sleigh. Oh, nice. Um, so you're not going anywhere? You're just laying low? Yes, that's what I always do for Thanksgiving. Really? Why do I not know this? You know this. I despise I this. Thanksgiving. I know, but I thought you like went somewhere or did something. or Isn't that when you made your cookies and almost burned down the apartment? Oh, I think that was for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I always committed arson. That was, yeah, that was Christmas. That was I that think holiday. that was Christmas. That sounds right. Um, no, I, I like to do nothing. I mean, sometimes we'll do anti-Thanksgiving and go to like a bar and a movie, but. Okay. I'm sure it's me and Captain. All right. So you, do you and Captain have any plans? Because that seems like a great day off. Like a it great is. Just, That's just what I mean, there. right? This is something that I'm extremely thankful for. People are always like, well, don't you have anywhere to go? Like, we'll invite you, please come over. And I, and then I feel bad because I say no to everybody because right. I love everyone, but I, I don't, and I don't believe that you should have to eat the same meal as everybody else. So I will probably have Thai food. Oh, that sounds good. What's your Thai go-to? Ch chicken Penang hot. Uh, I see. I'm normally a uh, Pad Thai guy because I'm not, but then I a couple really? times- well, here's the thing. In the past, I've done the um, grapau, mm -hmm. and I'm always like, just whatever it is. When they say, what's your spice? I'm like, just middle of the road, not too hot, not too cold. Um, and I feel one time I was burned by a place that clearly was like, we will show you. Yeah. I feel like I drank a gallon of milk and could not put up the fire in my mouth. Gotcha. And it really put me off. Anything okay. other than, and it was just like a, a little bit of a we'll show you round eye, which I get. I understand. Yeah. I'm not trying to be difficult. And I think that's no. mostly as a customer at a restaurant. That's my my goal. Yes. How do I not be difficult? Agreed. And so they took it out on me. That's rude. Yeah. So you guys, um, are you going to a movie? Are you guys going to go to a bar? I don't think so. Put I Captain think just, uh, Bjorn and just I might. go to a bar. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't put that past me. No. So just Thai food and yes. hang out on the yes. chair and yes. his lounge. Yes. All right. Sounds perfect. It does. It sounds better than just getting in the car for six hours and right? traveling and everyone's grumpy. And, and the weather's horrid. Yeah, usually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, You've sold me on this. Do you do a Friendsgiving yeah. later on or not even? No. I don't want turkey. Full no, stop. I don't. Well, I, yeah, I don't like the meal. <clears throat> I find the meal gross. It's impossible to keep everything hot at once. Mm -hmm. Do you so, do turkey other times of the year? I mean, if someone cooks turkey, I will eat it. But very I rarely don't... is someone saying we're roasting a whole bird. Come on over. Well, right. Isn't that funny? Like, what do they do? Like the rest of the year? Nobody buys yeah. turkey and makes turkey dinner ever. Yeah. It's weird. I mean, does Kenny Rogers, do the roasters, do they, or is that all chicken? That was chicken. Yeah, but they must be a turkey option. I don't know, but it's not, it's not really my jam. It's kind of like slimy. I had a very small window where I made myself a turkey sandwich and was like, now I get it. But like, really? I understand the appeal of turkey as a, as a protein. Really? Anderson's gone out of that phase. Yeah, it's like, so bland. Yeah. Like even chicken as a sandwich. Like there's a little something going on. Right. You can dress it up. You can put a hat on it. And it's a little right. more exciting. Yes. No, turkey is a bird. Uh, yeah, not that exciting. Do you guys have a bunch of those like wild turkeys walking around everywhere? Because uh, we do. We don't here. In Boston, we did. And the weirdest thing was um, they can get into trees. Yes, I know. Which was the most surreal thing. I like rounded a corner and there on someone's front yard. It's nuts. Five, six feet off the ground, a tree that is sick with turkeys. Right? It's very bizarre. It's very bizarre. Um, but you, you guys have a lot of We do, and we didn't turkeys. used to. When I was mm. little, this was not the thing, but they're everywhere. And then also we have a bunch of sandhill cranes now roaming the streets like okay. there's a so very is this something, weird bird do you like go happening. to the like the bus stop and just complain about turkeys taking over you should start uh, doing that 
I don't think we have. They're bus coming stops. in. They're taking we have their jobs. These, <laughs> right. We have all sorts of birds, but we don't really have bus stops. I live in Detroit. Right. They're coming in. They're taking our jobs. Heaven forbid we have public transportation. Right. Well, you can't do it all. Mm -mm. I guess you can either plan to kidnap and execute your governor, or you can ask for better public services. Right. Yeah. You can't I mean, do both. It's hard to do both. Yeah. This is why, with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. As a fellow Massachusetts, or, or should we say Mass Hole? I, I prefer Mass Hole. Yeah, I feel like it's more <laughs> fitting. And I do as, feel it's more fitting. Yeah, and as somebody who uses the word wicked as a way to describe something, um, do you still laugh when someone says offhandedly, oh, I once knew a man from Nantucket? I don't. Oh. I, I mean, I, and I'm, I'm. You're I mean, fun I I, and lighthearted, and then suddenly I use that, and you're just like, no, stop. For weeks. Um, no, <laughs> wait. I'm threatening this. No, for weeks. I'm like, stop. <laughs> don't do it. I think there's a bit of a giggle. It's the same for when someone says, like, where's the wizard or where's Toto? And uh, in regards mm. to my name. And so it's like, yeah. oh, it's a giggle. But at the same time, it also depends on the person because some people are just funny, right? Mm, and other people are like, true. And you didn't say it that funny, Luke. I right. thought I did. It's very offhand, but but still rhythmically it's a, fits the... It's okay. My whole life, everyone has asked how my grandfather is doing because my name is Heidi and she lived in the Alps with her grandfather. Mm. Oh, you've never had... One. Yeah, you've yes. never had anyone yell across a large open space that they are your father. Let That's me just put true. It that way. That but That's... anyway... All right, so we all need group therapy because yes. of our names, so... <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. We could start like a... I love that. We could start like oh a whole, right? whole thing. Oh a yeah. whole thing. Yeah. Good plan. And there's probably just some random dude named Paul McCartney out there that we can just be like, come on. Oh, no. for sure. It's okay. You know? Oh, definitely. And then there can be a group for people who look like them. Yes. Oh, that's a good one. Like a yeah. whole, we could start a whole like culture. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so we know how you got to that career, but how did you come to your work as a sex educator? I know you've had other yes. jobs before as columnist, you've written a book, you've gotten your master's. How did you kind of find yourself in this particular path? Yes, I've always been, since I was a child, always been obsessed with sex. And my mom told me, you know, as a teenager, she's like, if you want to have sex, then you need to be able to talk about sex. You need to be able to confidently go down to the store and get condoms and this is a small island right like I should be able to go to the right. and so as I as I started to think about this I'm like well if I want to have sex someday then I better be really good about talking about sex and so I, I became very comfortable and before I even started having sex I would teach people how to put condoms on a wooden dildo um for Pierce Morning because you're awareness. From <laughs> because i talk it is that Nantucket? the old timey yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> perfect and um so yes so it, i've it's always been there but when i was about 25 26 i really started to dive in deep i went through sexual trauma as a child and then as a teenager and so i was really going into my own healing and from there really started to discover um, so much about myself and my sexuality and then how much we aren't taught about our bodies. And so we're really given reproductive education, not sex education. And we barely have that, you know, in the United States, we barely, it's not necessarily regulated. You can teach um, misinformation in sex education. And a lot of sex education within the country is abstinence-based sex education. So that's how I came to it. And then I really stuck with it when my grandmother, um, before she passed away, I would go to the hospital and her doctor's appointments with her. And one of her gynecological exams, she dreaded going because it was so painful and going through sexual trauma after healing after that, knowing how to be in the doctor's office. I guided her, I was there with her. And real after talking with the doctor, the doctor informed us that her vaginal canal atrophied. So oh, she, wow. she didn't even know this. No doctor explained this to her before. And 
And so we had this conversation afterwards because from my research, you can open the vaginal canal again. It just takes a little bit of work, but you can do that. And so she's like, wait, so I could have had happy years with my husband, but because no one talks about this, I That's missed out. So sad. It's so sad. And then oh. the, the health challenges, not even just sexual challenges, but the health challenges that happen from the vaginal canal atrophying. So that's when I, we both decided I need to talk more about sex. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in your practice and then you're working with people, how often do you kind of reach a point where you're talking to someone and realize to yourself, oh man, they do not know as much as I thought most people know or just how uninformed people are as a whole it, it always is a spectrum and so i've definitely have a lot of people that don't necessarily know that um the vulva has um erectile tissue they don't realize that it takes about 20 to 40 minutes for the vulva to essentially become erect just like the penis does so same erectile tissue the clitoris would be what would be similar to like a shaft and the tip of the penis, um, that all becomes erect. So a lot of people don't realize that. And another part that a lot of people don't realize is the vaginal canal when it's fully ready for something to be in inserted will suck the object up. And so that's pretty powerful when you experience that, that the body really will let, the, um, will let you know when it's ready and how often we force things because we want to be ready or we want to have sex with our partner. That's interesting. It's got to be fascinating the various ways people come in with just so many and and like you mentioned with our in our country it does sort of feel like we're going backwards. It does. It does for it, and it's it is it's 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 sad to see um, and I'm very hopeful that sometimes we break down to rebuild. And I think with, especially like in regards to Roe versus, Ro versus Wade, this was something that wasn't on solid ground. And so we need to rebuild it. And I really do think a major factor is body autonomy. And a lot of, you know, save with top freedom on Nantucket beaches is about that top, is about body autonomy, how we all are in charge of our bodies and should be in charge of our bodies. And it's not necessarily, you know, it's wonderful for privacy. That was a way to get things through before, but now it really needs to be about everyone in charge of their own body and being able to do what they want with their own body. Right. Well, let's move on to that. Um, you sort of reached another level of public awareness in the past, what, year and a half because of your work to try to make the beaches of Nantucket topless. How did you start this movement? I think we've got a little bit into the why, but can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I would say the seed was planted years, years ago. I saw this cartoon and the cartoon had a female body and a male body and they had the exact same body. Um, and they were both topless. And he said, Helen, like how, look at you, you're indecent. Damn it, and Helen. <laughs> it's always Helen. It's Helen, it's yeah, Helen. always Helen. <laughs> Well, the whole Troy thing, you know, yeah. started it all. <laughs> See, and those are the names, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. back to the, the group, yeah. our, our support yeah. group. That's what's happening. Once we solve the beaches, it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> Helen Troy is going to be <laughs> oh, yeah. right in here. So that's where the seed was planted. And then I do like to go topless on the beach. And so we have a nude beach, a, you know, an, a, a not legal nude beach but it's already it's sort of always been there so I sometimes will go there and I was um but it, it, one particular instance I was not at the beach and so I was um at a different beach where you couldn't be topless and I had this moment when I wanted to be topless and I realized I couldn't and as I looked around the beach I'm like wait I you know there are people that there are men that have bigger breasts than I do right now mm -hmm. but they're able to be topless why can't I be topless and that started to get me to think and then to research and I'm not necessarily, I, I should say, I know I'm not, I don't have the legal mind. My sister, Ada Ruth, <laughs> really helped me out with this because she has the legal background. And so as we started to research, um, we started to realize that starting at age five, um, 
female bodies are not able to be topless. So already we're sexualizing children wow. at such a young age. So, and the fact, as we started really digging, we're like, oh my gosh, there's a $300 fine if you're topless at the beach. And then you start to dig in, you can be on the sex offender list. So it's, it just, it all didn't make sense. And I, I thought, okay, well, we, you know, maybe Nantucket can have this, you know, the beaches be top optional. And so that's when I met with town council. Um, and then I submitted the article and I didn't expect it to go this far as far as like people really, I just thought, you know, okay. Um, I, I definitely knew it'd be something on Nantucket, controversial on Nantucket. Sure. I didn't realize the extent. Well, it seems yes. like you said, it's really the tentacles of this have reached across the country and, and people seem to have an opinion if, if the message boards and the comments section on articles are, are anything to, uh, to count. But what is the response that you've seen on the island where it actually matters what people think? Right. It's been an array, but the more that I, I, someone asked me, what have you done to campaign for this? And I've done nothing. I just, <laughs> that's, that's on you. The, yeah. hundred <laughs> percent the laziest. I just, I submitted the article and, and that was that. And I had so many people that came up to me that started off saying, I do, I, I love you, but I'm not voting yes for this. I'm like, I completely understand you, you know, follow, follow your, follow your intuition. And, and then as things progressed, so many people within the community were educating each other. And that's really where this took root was everyone coming together and having discussions. So from there, then I got up at town meeting and I gave the facts. That's all I, I, I didn't give opinion. I gave the facts. It was less than a hundred years ago that men um, gained their top freedom before, you know, in the nine before the 1920s, men were not allowed to be topless at the beach. It was considered mm. indecent. And so I, I started giving these facts about top freedom at beaches. And a lot of people ended up changing their minds. They're like, okay, well, that now makes sense to me. Hmm. So I still have some people that message or write letters that don't agree. And I love that. I think that's the best part of democracy is the fact that people get to have an opinion. It's true, but you know, some of those people are flying off to France or the Caribbean and whipping their tops <laughs> off. But it's like, it's fine if I'm here, but never in Nantucket. Which doesn't right. make any sense. It doesn't. But one of the best parts has been people who are like, all right, I, I never thought of going to Nantucket. I thought it was way too stuffy. And right. now I'm I'm going to change oh, my plans. So I've sure. had I, people like that too, which is awesome because you're like, okay, great. This this could really work out. <laughs> yeah. So my family will start turning up. Beware. Oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize only a hundred years ago it was illegal. And is that why they were wearing those striped yes. one piece suits yeah. with the barbells that said 100 LBS yes. on them? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Their nipples had to be covered. And they're, they're, always they're, okay. Yes. And women were protesting that men shouldn't be topless at beaches because it's indecent and no one should be seeing a hairy chest. And oh. I love there's so many different parts of right. some of the, um, <laughs> the, the feedback then, the opposition and the s similar stories now. It's like, that's indecent for a child to see breasts. It's like, wait what did they see when they were breastfeeding right mm. you, like yeah. that's sexualized so crazy. it right i know we've sexualized it and and it is sad because there's a lot of um female bodies out there that do believe that breasts are for their partner for their husband or um and so it's it's sad that so many parts of the female body um society has said belongs to somebody else and not to themselves right so where does it stand now? It's gone, it's passed in Nantucket and it's waiting for the attorney general to sign off on, correct? That's correct. So she has until December 3rd to decide. And but she's, I, she's currently running for governor, so. She is. And the so, fact that she's checking her email, it's probably not <laughs> super high. It's I mean, I don't not, want to. I would you think never it's know. high. She might be a listener. <laughs> and if she is more of, please, just, just sign the thing. Yeah, um, not a political show, but but 
we make yes. exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> to all of well, our attorney guests listeners. You've definitely yeah. had yes. some very interesting people, right? Like, so <laughs> we definitely have. <laughs> but we have never had an attorney general, Mora. True. Especially one. one who changed the beach culture of Nantucket and made it a more yeah. welcoming place. Changed people's ability to wear strapless dresses all summer long without bad tan lines. Exactly. That's that's God's work right there. Right? I mean, that's a whole campaign slogan in itself. It Was is. that part of your campaign? God's work? Uh, no, the no. idea uh, tan lines. That you can get rid of your tan lines and wear anything you want without them. That was not part of the campaign, but I've seen a lot of people tag their friends being like, finally. Right? It's very true. It is an important part of this. On top of it's just so much. It just feels so wonderful to be topless on a beach. It does. And you think about it. I've, I have a few friends that um, there wasn't anyone on the beach and they decided to go topless. And they're like, oh, it just feels so much better, especially in the heat. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, oh, to be free. It's, it's like akin to... It's akin to when you come home and Luke totally would be like, why are you talking about this? It's akin to when you come home after a long day and you take your bra off. It's the exact yeah. same feeling. Only there's sun, which makes it better. Yes. And we need the sun. Yes. There's mm -hmm. definitely studies that show us we need the sun. And you, those that have um, a, a nutritious diet and the sun tend not to have skin cancer, See? which is, it's really the diet. So it's really wild. We, we need sun on our bodies for sure. I just keep picturing the entire town council looking like the cast of CODA. <laughs> and I'm from Massachusetts and I still think of that. Like it's like the perfect storm crew is all just sitting there with yes. corn cob pipes voting. <laughs> I love that. I mean, there's a little bit, okay. there's a Thank little you. bit. Yeah, definitely. So it seems like being a sex, sex educator can be a difficult thing to talk about, like we've said, mm -hmm. and especially on a place that is so insular and so, I don't say remote, but you know, you it gotta is. make plans to go there to get to Nantucket. Has that been hard for you? Or is it just since you've grown up there, you don't really know any other way to get the word out? when it comes to sex education yes, yeah. and it being challenging, I, I feel very fortunate to have the parents that I do. My parents are very much, um, yes, Christian conservative. I grew up in a Christian conservative household. And so I have that, that foundation. Um, but we were sex positive and not necessarily, my parents were hoping that I would be married for the first time, you know, married to my partner as they were, um, but they wanted to make sure I was, that sex was talked about for sure. So there was that more um, sex positive growing up and knowing our bodies. And, and so with that foundation, and also I have a mom that's very, or I did, she passed away, but she was very outspoken and she was someone where she taught us it's okay if no one's liking you you still need to speak your truth and you still need to and live in integrity and so with that foundation i'm really able to blossom as this with this role and i find the more i talk about it the more people come forward being like instead of suffering in silence so i i think i the my combination of my my personality i think is allows people the open space to maybe ask those questions that um are challenging or they feel embarrassed by so that they can come forward and and not suffer in silence and i think that's the biggest part and so how do you teach people are there classes is it a group class is there scrimshaw involved <laughs> i need to get scrimshaw involved that would be incredible that would be a great um nantucket workshop for oh sure God. nantucket <laughs> nectars guys are you listening oh the nantucket nectars get, guys get those vineyard sure. vine sure. get them to do it yes. oh my gosh that, you know i could totally see that there's like an erotic mm -hmm. um tie line there's an erotic oh, sure. scrimshaw like i can i can see it all forming and it's yeah. happening right here right now Life yes. is good. Get them this involved. Is, oh. That totally falls oh under their ethos. Salt I think life that would be. 
Yes. So, but anyway, so what are yes. the classes like that you yes. would be using their scrimshaw in? Yes. <laughs> the so, pitch right here. <laughs> <laughs> I teach online classes. So the Nanticket Love School is an online platform. I, I am moving towards um, retreats and in-person workshops. Um, it's funny because even before the pandemic, I just preferred online. I like I like online teaching, um, but because of the pandemic, now I want the in-human contact, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. So I'm like, oh, maybe I will teach in person, but I, I teach online. So I'll meet with one-on-one -on -one with students and then I'll also do group work as well. And so, which I find extremely powerful because once you start talking about sex in a group and people feel safe, it really starts to open up because there's so many things that we just, we think, oh, it's weird or it's strange or it's, it's a stupid question. And if somebody else asks it, it then opens up the box and we can really dig in and, and then people don't stay in the dark anymore. So yeah, a lot of people feel broken, I think sexually. And, and so it's nice when we can talk about things and, and people can start to really learn about their bodies and, and feel more empowered and embodied. Is there ever a time where no one's brave enough to be the first one to speak? Totally. Definitely. Oh. <laughs> definitely. And there's some people that um, maybe they don't want their video on or they have a different name or which this is another reason why I love the online teaching, because you don't have to show up in person. It's true. <laughs> yeah. And so you're able to be a completely different person if you want to. And you don't have to worry about someone else judging you. Although it's not that space, it's very, um, we have working agreements. So beforehand, we really create that space with each other to be able to talk about things. So, um, but I do, there are definitely times when people don't, aren't, don't feel ready to ask and they may ask offline too. And then I can bring it forward and, and that gets the discussion going. Sure. As the teacher, do you prefer doing group classes? Do you see more um, growth and benefit to a group setting or a one-on-one -on -one consultation? That's such a good question because they both have, I love, I love seeing the spark. Mm -hmm. So no matter who I'm working with, I love seeing the aha moments and the spark and the possibilities. So whenever I do find it's very powerful in the group setting because one person can share how they experience the homework and someone else can go, wait, that's possible. Like I had one student where she was able to experience colors while she was having her orgasm. And cause we combine spirit. So we combine meditation and breath work and prayer. Um, and so it's more than just sex education. We combine a lot more, which leads to these deeper and expansive experiences. And so she was talking about, you know, seeing colors while she had an orgasm. And someone else was like, wait, I need that too. Like, <laughs> what did you, <laughs> how do we do this? Um, so it's, it's very expansive because when you start to hear someone else say, I was able to do this, then you go, oh, it's possible. Like it's actually mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the homework is not like read the first 50 pages of Great Gatsby. <laughs> yes, it's pleasure work. I call it love work. Okay. That Good works. way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> but it, 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 it's, I mean, it's not necessarily the easiest parts, the easiest homework, because it does require you to, to dig in. And, and part of this is healing because many of us have blockages. Many of us um, you know, especially if you've been through sexual trauma, there's blockages in your body. And if you've been through any sort of trauma, uh, the body, there's a book called The Body Keeps Score. And so it's a really beautiful book. And it really does talk about the trauma that can can really get trapped into our bodies. And so part of this work is we're healing that trauma, um, healing, healing our bodies, unblocking our bodies. And as we do that, we use pleasure so sometimes it can be taking a pause and, and getting into our bodies and, and knowing we don't have to um, do anything we're not ready for, but once we're ready, we can let things go. So it can be challenging, maybe emotionally, because you're unblocking, but then you heal it with pleasure. 
which that's that's all right like that's a I mean, much that's better great. way than that's way better say. than some of the other <laughs> stuff they tell you to do to heal things <laughs> <laughs> and just i mean you're no longer going to resent that one person being like you forgot to assign homework so there's <laughs> that's that true. that's nice that's a big part actually a lot of people so say for instance right we're on a certain schedule we're, we're, we're learning certain things every week um i I am, I've never been the teacher where you have to, like, for instance, even in my yoga classes, I, people would come in late. I'm like, come in, like, who cares? You're late. Like, who cares? Right. And if you don't want to do what I'm teaching, whatever, like, do, do your thing. I, I have no issue with that whatsoever. I know what people do, but for me, I think everything happens in its own time. And so divine timing, I do believe is at play. And so if someone is maybe on the first week of the love work and they're, they come to class, but they are ready to move forward for whatever reason to hold that space and, and congratulate them on like knowing themselves and, and having that boundary or, or really honoring where they're at in the progress. So I think that's really important. We, we, we rush people too often and we put pressure. And so I, I hate, I like casual, I don't like pressure. <laughs> That's good. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. That's does anyone I mean. else? Yeah. Does anyone actually really like pressure? I don't know. That's, People yeah. sometimes say they thrive under it, but I think that's a lie. Yeah. yeah. I think that's like a trauma response. I think so too. It's yeah. weird. I would agree. Yeah. How many of no. your students are coming because of some sort of past trauma or something they're trying to mm -hmm. work through? And how many are just interested in enjoying sex in a different way or trying to expand their relationship and communication with their partner it's it's a smattering of all the above so but not as many people come forward with sexual trauma that are using this work i have a few clients i have a few students and um more so i have a lot more people that maybe have never experienced an orgasm and so through this work that's they've been able to experience orgasm so maybe before they, you know, for years, maybe no orgasm or pleasure in their bodies. And then through what I've, what I've shared, they've been able to experience orgasm. And the orgasm I'd like to say is not the tippity top of pleasure. So, but sometimes that's a goal for people. Mm -hmm. I feel like it is. I feel like not that it's the tippity top, but that people are like that. That's the only way that's it. That's it. That's all there is. Yeah, we've definitely been taught that um, for a sexual experience to be successful, there has to be an orgasm involved, and and it's P to V, right? Yeah, right, <laughs> it's like, right. It's like no, there's so much more, and and I think there's a lot of pressure for anybody, um, male, female. There's going to be pressure for performance and if we take orgasm off the table, if we take penetration off the table, it does lead to these wonderful, pleasurable experiences um, that I don't think a lot of people are um, talking about. So I'd like to see more of that, that you don't necessarily have to have penetration to have an incredible experience with your partner. Well, and it sounds like maybe that there's a lot more undoing that you yeah. do oh my gosh, with folks. Yeah that yes. is sort of trying to rewire that thinking and trying to just change the conversation or go down a different path like you said it is actually that the undoing that makes so much sense and and thank you for saying that that is definitely a lot of this work because even um with how we maybe are for a lot of females they're focused on their partner and then they aren't focused on themselves and their own pleasure and they don't own their pleasure. So then they end up um, maybe being resentful of their partner or not interested in sex because then it's a whole lot of work. Mm -hmm. So um, it's undoing that for sure that they're not there just to please their partner. Um, not there just to have, you know, sex in the traditional way that we've been taught in society of what sex looks like and so you have the courses 
and now you also have a podcast. Is there a way that you are not helping people improve their attitude towards sex and in practice and in thought? Another thing, I, another thing next? I can do. Yeah, another yes. thing I can yeah. do. <laughs> Cameo? You know, right back great. to pressure. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. <laughs> what, yeah. Can, with Cameo, is that like... I could that's the teach, celebrity like, mini classes. Oh, that's true. Like, I'm, I'm, so glad, class? I'm so glad we are recording this. We are <laughs> rewriting the rule book for everything. We have all the good ideas. Here. We really this do. Is, I love this it. This is like a focus group. Yes. <laughs> perfect. I love it. <laughs> but, um, but the, and the podcast is another way. And, and the two, like all of this, you have Nantucket in the name of your school. But yes. you obviously reach beyond just the island. I do, yes. And the same thing with the podcast, correct? Yes. I mean, it is available everywhere. How is that going? Are you enjoying that process of putting the stuff out there? Because you am. don't get it's... that feedback the same way. I don't. And I, I do. I really enjoy the process. I'm always surprised when... Um, I have Buzzsprout. That's the platform yep. I use. Yep, we do too. And... <laughs> Get that. Free advertising for Buzzsprout. <laughs> Are you listening, Buzzsprout? Right. <laughs> I, I, and so I'll get these emails that say, you've had this many listeners. And I'm like, really? Like people <laughs> name <laughs> them. I yeah. <laughs> they sent you like the little, like with the little, like happy, like the little, like right, sparklers like, and stuff, confetti. Exactly. Like, well, it's so, on. <laughs> I know. So yeah, I, I'm very surprised. It's definitely a leap of faith putting, putting it out there. I'm just following the guidance I feel from spirit, which, and so that's, that's, that's what I do um so yes but i do and i do really enjoy it also i'm really enjoying the interviews so i started doing more interviews with different people and that i think is so special is has i have you found the same thing like because that's what you do oh, you get to talk to all these different people in different walks of life and i mean you had naked yoga and <laughs> It's incredible. <laughs> and what's incredible about it is how many people kind of like what you were saying, when you just start to talk to people, you realize we're not all as different as we think we are. Yes. Or even if we are, we kind of start to understand each other better and go, okay, you're not quite as odd as I thought you might be or whatever it is. And it's incredible. Yeah, I'm really lucky to get to do that. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So what's your next plan to um, free the rest of our minds? Ooh. You've got the beaches. I have the it beaches. seems like that's in hand, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's next? What else you got planned? Um, oh, gosh. Apart from I, the erotic scrimshaw. I, I, you know, I think that really is the next move is the erotic scrimshaw. I feel like yeah. that's calling to me. I think that's got to happen. <laughs> My I, great my great uncle was actually a scrimshaw artist. That was his career, what? but he's long past. Otherwise, we'd work him into it. <laughs> We're sending him some love. He's with us now, inspiring yes, us. Exactly. Can you imagine that? Like doing the erotic. I feel this would be really amazing. It would be amazing. Oh. It would be wicked really amazing. amazing. Wicked, wicked amazing. amazing. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's amazing. So well, yeah, I, I don't know what my next, I, you know, I have the sacred sexual soul series, which includes everyone, um, all bodies. So people can learn more about their own bodies, their partner, partner practices. And I think the next thing I would love to, to venture into is the, the in-person workshops. And um, because that is a whole other level of combining the yoga background and sex education and spirit education. And I, I think those would be really beautiful to help people. Lots, a lot more hugging too. I feel like we need more mm. hugs. Yeah. Yeah. Too. Very good. For more information about Dorothy's Nantucket Top Equality, her Sacred Sexual Soul series, or the Nantucket After Dark podcast, you can go to her website, dorothystover.com. She's also on Facebook, where she's at facebook.com slash dorothy.stover. You can check us out on all the various socials, 
be sure to visit our website and don't forget to leave us a review. Today's show is produced by myself and Heidi Hegquist. Our reluctant producers are John Sauvé and Sandy Stone. Our willing producers are Rachel Allen and Randy Jeanette. Our intern is Zach Jackson. This one's for Philippe. Thanks for joining us. Flash, we're coming home. Nigel, is that you? Are you here, Nigel?